Hello, Dr. Tong, can you hear me? Nice to see you. Thank you very much for yeah, nice to see you also. Attending and delivering us a lecture. I will briefly introduce you first. So sorry. Uh, okay, I think it's time. So I think we can start our session. On behalf of Professor Dong Su Lee, I'd like to introduce uh, our today's lecturer, uh, Professor Take It Tan. Dr. Tan is currently a staff member in the Department of Nuclear Medicine at Sunway Medical Center and also currently president of Malaysia Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. So Dr. Tan has accumulated outstanding achievement in the research of nuclear medicine oncology. Moreover, he devoted himself to the establishment of diagnostics in Malaysia and also our Korean patient have been beneficial for his devotion and uh, so, sorry. Sorry, our residents are having a lunch. So sorry for that. So, and so he actually devoted himself for the establishment and the education of next generation of nuclear medicine in Asia. So today, Dr. Tan will deliver us a lecture regarding nuclear medicine and diagnostics in Malaysia. So he will show us some practical issues in establishing and future aspects of diagnostics. So please welcome Dr. Take It Tong. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen first. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let me share my screen. All right, so uh, are you able to see the slide? Yes, we see it well. All right, okay, thanks. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me uh, to share with you uh, today's topics uh, on the status of uh, nuclear medicines uh, and uh, terranostics uh, in Malaysia. So uh, I'm uh, uh, Tan, I'm uh, actually currently the president of the Malaysia Society of uh, Nuclear Medicine and uh, Molecular Imaging. And also I'm the uh, uh, nuclear medicine physicians currently working in the Summit Medical uh, Center. So uh, just to give you an overview of my uh, uh, the center that I'm working uh, uh, at. So uh, I'm, uh, the Summit Medical Center is basically is a private uh, center. It's uh, one of the uh, largest uh, uh, tertiary and the quaternary uh, hospital uh, in Malaysia. So uh, as you can see uh, on your uh, right hand side, uh, the, the bottom uh, photo shows the entrance uh, of our uh, new uh, departments. So uh, we acquired the PET scan in 2015 uh, with Biograph. And then uh, this year we installed the new uh, uh, in digital uh, PET CT, uh, the United Imaging PET CT. And we also have uh, one uh, SPEC CT scanner, uh, mainly uh, used uh, for uh, uh, post uh, uh, therapy uh, imaging and also also uh, sometime for a pediatric uh, case and bone scan. All right, so um, just an outline of my presentations. I will uh, start with uh, the, to define uh, the definitions of terranostics, especially in uh, Malaysia, and what are the uh, current uh, status uh, of a uh, terranostic, a uh, nuclear medicine status in Malaysia and the challenges uh, when to set up the uh, Theranostic Center and how we get there. Okay, um, the word uh, Theranostic uh, may be uh, quite common uh, among the uh, nuclear medicines uh, personnel, but uh, this wording is basically uh, not so uh, familiar uh, by the, uh, the our uh, oncology colleagues and also uh, by the other uh, uh, disciplines. So sometimes if you want to use the word terranostic uh, to sell our uh, treatments uh, to the other uh, discipline doctors, uh, sometimes we may face uh, the difficulty. 
And uh, second thing is that even though the radionuclide therapy has been uh, quite some times, but this wording sometimes is not also quite familiar uh, by the uh, insurance company. And uh, this may cause uh, the patients unable to get the insurance reimbursements. Because of this uh, difficulty, uh, the uh, Society of uh, Malaysian Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, we are trying to redefine uh, these uh, two words. So for theranostics, we use the same definition, it's involved the use of the same target uh, for radionuclide imaging and therapy. However, for uh, radionuclide uh, therapy, we have uh, add in add in, uh, another nomenclature, uh, which is the targeted molecular radiotherapy, uh, and is defined as a type of radiation therapy that involves a radioactive drug called uh, radiopharmaceutical that targets the specific cells. Because I think for the insurance company, they are more familiar with the wording like targeted therapy or radiotherapy. So we add these two uh, wording in so that uh, patients uh, may get uh, the, the insurance reimbursements, especially in our country. Right? So just to uh, share with you an overview of a nuclear medicine center in Malaysia. So up to 2021, we have about uh, 33 million of populations. And uh, the whole country, we only have uh, around 35 uh, nuclear medicine center, uh, the registered nuclear medicine center. Uh, but uh, out of the 35, there are about two to three uh, centers, uh, mainly is cater for uh, radio iodine treatments uh, given by our oncology uh, colleagues. And uh, these two, these centers uh, do not have any nuclear medicine uh, imaging facility. So, uh, so it's uh, only about 33 uh, centers, imaging centers, if you divide by the uh, number of uh, total number of uh, population is around uh, one uh, nuclear medicine center per million, 1 million populations. And if you look at the, uh, the states, uh, Malaysia's actually have around uh, 13 uh, states uh, with uh, federal uh, uh, states. Uh, so uh, if you look at the, uh, the distributions of the nuclear medicine center uh, in, the, uh, in the states of the, uh, of the country, you can see that the main uh, uh, is not uh, even. And if you look at the PET scan, it's mainly uh, located at the state that are uh, more uh, developed, and uh, which is the Penang, Klang Valley, Malacca, Johor, and Sarawak. And these uh, five to six states are usually have a higher uh, GDP, uh, GDP per capita compared to the other states. Okay, and then uh, this slide basically to show to you uh, the development of the targeted uh, radionuclide therapy in Malaysia. Uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, started the IOD 131 long time ago, and then in uh, about uh, 2000, uh, we start adding uh, additional uh, radionuclide therapy like IOD MIBG, uh, bone palations, cyanobactomy, and IOD 131 uh, reduzumab. But uh, I think the IOD 131 reduzumab is no longer available in the country because they are more uh, uh, more advanced uh, targeted uh, treatments or more, uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, by our hematology uh, colleague. So in 2015, uh, we started uh, the more advanced uh, radionuclide therapy uh, using the uh, 177 lutetium PRLT. Then we move uh, forwards to Y90 PRLT. 177 PSMA, and uh, this year we got our actinium 225 uh, being approved by, by our Ministry of Health. So we are going to start uh, these new uh, treatments uh, in January. And for CERT, uh, actually it, uh, the CERT uh, treatment had been uh, started uh, before, two, before 2010 uh, by the intervention radiologists uh, in the, one of the university hospital. Uh, hospital. And then now uh, uh, this uh, treatment is more uh, or less are taken uh, by the nuclear medicine uh, physician. Right. Okay, so uh, uh, what are the challenges that we face uh, when we are uh, starting uh, the uh, targeted radionuclide therapy? Uh, the first thing is uh, how do you going, uh, how are we going to get our patients? Therefore, uh, publicity and awareness is very important because uh, our patient pool is usually come from uh, the treating clinicians like the oncologists, and the gastroenterologist and endocrinologist. And also, uh, how do you going to get your uh, radioisotope uh, to your country? Uh, and also, how do you going to uh, quote the pricings uh, for your treatments? Because uh, this treatment sometimes is not uh, covered by the insurance and also will not cover by the government. 
So uh, how do you go and quote the price so that it's not uh, too high that the patient unable to uh, receive these treatments? And also how do you go to train uh, your uh, staff and also your other colleagues uh, regarding uh, radionuclide uh, therapy so uh, everyone uh, know uh, what radionuclide therapy is all about and uh, finally is how do you going to convince your uh, authority your local authority uh, to uh, allow you to start this uh, radionuclide therapy so we start uh, with uh, how do we get there so before i start uh, i will just give you a brief uh, uh, a summary on the radiation therapy because uh, if you want to do a more advanced uh, radionuclide therapy it's not easy you must have uh, the at least uh, some uh, fundamental knowledge on how our uh, radiation oncology colleague doing so in this uh, current world uh, uh, in the radio radiation therapy we already moved towards a more uh, precision oncology so when you want to start a radionuclide uh, therapy, uh, we, you need to understand the whole uh, pictures on how do you going to manage the patients from A to Z. So uh, and when you receive the patients, you may, might need to look at the patient age, the comorbidity, the tumor burdens, and how do you going to work out uh, the patients uh, from the tumor biopsy, the histopathology report, and the uh, uh, hormonal uh, uh, results. And also uh, how do you, how they do the molecular profiling uh, like uh, not only for functional imaging like gallium dotate you need to know how uh, functional uh, mri uh, M is doing mp mri is doing and how do you correlate uh, these two imaging and also uh, how do you how do you do a genetic testing like uh, currently uh, we are doing the uh, bka uh, testings uh, for prostate cancers so you can add in the part inhibitors uh, when you are when you want to treat with a psma and then also how do you going to analyze all the data before you plan your treatment options and with regard to the treatment uh, plan you need to discuss with your other colleague as well because uh, these patients uh, may not necessarily just receive a radio neglect therapy they might also uh, receive some other uh, treatments like chemotherapy and uh, targeted uh, more localized uh, radiation therapy and also they might uh, receive uh, some immunotherapy and and also the quite important thing is that this is the usual uh, question that they ask is how do you going to sequence your treatments with the other treatments are you going to start with uh, uh, PRT first before the octreotide or you start with octreotide first before a chemotherapy or a PSMA before uh, the second line uh, ADT. So all these things you need to discuss with your colleague and find the best uh, solution in helping uh, our patients. And the third one is that uh, how do you going to assess the treatment response? Uh, not only uh, using the gallium dotate images, sometimes you might need to use uh, the, uh, the other more conventional uh, imaging like a CT scan to look at the size and also uh, to look at the biomarker like the circulating uh, tumor cells, circulating DNA, or the PSA level, or even the common graining A to assess the patients. So all this uh, should be kept in mind uh, when you want to embark to a more uh, advanced uh, radionuclear therapy because you are no longer uh, just uh, Im uh, imaging doctors, you are already moved towards a more uh, oncology, uh, uh, oncology field. So um, just to uh, recap back, uh, uh, the, the thing that you need to consider uh, prior to start the more advanced uh, targeted radiotherapy. Uh, although we have um, uh, experience uh, in the differentiated direct carcinoma, but just bear in mind uh, the, the, the treating of uh, neuroendocrine tumors and the metastatic carcinoma resistant prostate cancer is a different ball game. Okay, when you want uh, when we treat with a uh, direct cancer, usually the patient sent to us is a younger age. Uh, with a, a good comorbidity and they usually have no symptom and just stand here for remnant ablation which is not uh, actually a, a cancer or a mass and they have uh, the, the tumor is basically you just want to ablate the normal thyroid tissue they don't even have a tumor burden there so uh, that and usually the popular thyroid carcinoma as we know uh, currently uh, this uh, uh, cancer are not so aggressive and have a very have a very good uh, prognosis so uh, when we treat the patients, patient actually recovered from radioactive iodine. It may not necessarily to say that the treatment is actually successful. It's just that because uh, the treatment is basically to help us to, uh, to ablate the remnant uh, thyroid tissue. Okay, so uh, when you move to neuroendocrine tumor, 
or a metastatic causation a recent product cancels, you are actually dealing with a more uh, advanced uh, age group of patients, especially uh, prostate cancer, where they usually come with you with a metastasis and have been treated with a, a multiple treatments. And when they come to you, they are already about at the age of uh, 70 or 80s. Okay, and uh, these two group of patients, usually they have a more disease burdens, they have a high uh, metastasis in the liver like nets, and also in bone uh, or no, uh, nodes in the uh, uh, prostate cancers. And these uh, two types of treatment, because they have been treated, heavily treated with the other treatments, so the, 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 the tumor are usually are more aggressive. And like a prostate cancer, sometimes they have been treated with the radiation therapy before, so uh, they sometimes are more uh, radio resistance. And patients will come to you with symptoms as well, like in neuroendocrine, they may come to you with a diarrhea, uh, persistent diarrhea because of the hormonal issue and may have persistent uh, hypoglycemia because of the insulinoma. And for prostate cancer, they may have bone pains and they might have a, a uropathy, obstructive uropathy, where you might need to uh, perform the drainage first before you can do uh, the treatments. So uh, for response as well, uh, the radionuclide therapy for NETS and uh, prostate cancer are not uh, like uh, iodine. Uh, the response sometimes is a bit uh, heterogeneous because the, 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 treatment, the tumor itself is very heterogeneous. Depends on the patient have been receiving uh, uh, which type of treatment before the radionuclide therapy. And adverse effect also is one of the things we need to uh, consider because this group of patients usually they might have uh, low blood counts before you, with prior to starting the treatments. And uh, they might easy to get a myelosuppressions because of the prior uh, chemotherapies being given uh, to the patients. So the level of the complexity actually increases uh, from direct cancer to neuroendocrine tumor and to prostate cancer. Okay, so just to share with you our experience, uh, uh, how we started our, uh, our first uh, PRT treatment in Malaysia in 2015. And uh, here I would like to uh, uh, very uh, thanks to uh, Professor Ronnie Hicks and also Michael Hormans that uh, actually helped us uh, to start uh, these treatments uh, in Malaysia. So when we want to start a PRT in Malaysia in 2015, uh, please note that in 2015, uh, Lutetium-177 uh, and PRT is still not uh, being uh, approved by the FDA and even in the European uh, medicines uh, agency. So this drug actually is considered an unregistered drug, so even in Malaysia. So uh, if you want to proceed with this treatment, we need to get uh, uh, approval uh, from our authority and also to convince our uh, colleagues, uh, the oncology colleagues and the endocrinologist colleagues to send the patients to us uh, for these treatments. So we started by having our first uh, regional uh, multidisciplinary uh, neuroendocrine tumor board uh, by inviting uh, the oncologists, the surgeons, the hepatobiliary surgeons, the endocrinologists, and also uh, the hepatologists and radiologists to sit together and discuss the case uh, on a neuroendocrine uh, tumor. So that time also we we are not we will uh, we will discuss the case and also we will find the best uh, op treatment options uh, to the patients. And this this is a time that we start to introduce a PRLT uh, to them uh, for patients that are already a uh, few uh, other treatments. Then um, we also have our first uh, multidisciplinary PRT workshop uh, in April. That time we invited uh, Professor Ronnie Hicks to come over to Malaysia. Uh, so uh, he can actually help us to answer some of the questions uh, by our oncologists. Because at time we don't have any experience uh, uh, on these treatments and how, the, how we're going to manage the patient and also how the, the response uh, of the patients. Then uh, uh, we actually over to Peter McC uh, McCallum's and to uh, look at how the process is being done and also to, um, to, to look at the, the equipment that are needed before we uh, perform our PRLT. So uh, uh, lastly, uh, in June 2015, uh, we invited uh, Prof Professor Michael Hoffman to come over uh, to uh, Malaysia and he, he actually supervised uh, the procedure for us and make sure that we are doing the thing correctly. So this is how uh, the PRLT is started uh, in Malaysia in 2015. It's a very, uh, a long uh, process and involve a lot of money as well. So when we started the uh, the PRT uh, treatments, we actually are not uh, strict uh, going to clinical. We actually uh, uh, helping the uh, we actually do it in under our own uh, uh, institutional uh, grants. 
So we actually collected uh, some patients and we, uh, we monitor them and make sure that they are uh, patients are well and uh, there's uh, no uh, side effects involved. So along the way, uh, we uh, gather more patients and when I moved to uh, Southern Medical Center, we also uh, perform our um, retrospective analysis. And that time also we, uh, we, we have a patients uh, from Korea to come over. So we get uh, enough number of uh, patients in a very short period of times. So at that time we, collect, we collected about 73 patients and have been treated around 100 to 200 cycles and uh, shows a very good uh, objective response for neuroendocrine chemo patients uh, as overall and a very good response also in the uh, gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So at that time we are more confident of providing uh, these treatments uh, to our patients. So apart uh, from uh, the education uh, part, we actually need to uh, 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 have a very close uh, relationship uh, with the other discipline, other colleagues. So um, in Malaysia, we actually uh, uh, started the, the, the first uh, Asia Pacific Neuroendocrine Tumor Society uh, in, in the Asia Pacific regions, uh, headed by uh, our uh, hepatobiliary surgeons and the uh, uh, faculty member uh, include the histopathology, the oncology, and also gastroenterologists and uh, endocrinologists and nuclear medicine uh, physicians. So um, uh, previously in 2009, uh, we started this society and we also are doing a, a yearly uh, conference to, um, and uh, usually this conference is a multidisciplinary conference where everyone will gather around and we will discuss uh, the case and also the updates on the treatment and the imaging uh, for neuroendocrine tumor. And in 2019, uh, we are able to publish our own uh, local uh, consensus guideline on uh, GAPNETS. So along the way, uh, we gather more uh, confidence. So this year, uh, with the help of IEA and uh, and uh, and also uh, Professor Schobens, so we uh, hold our uh, first uh, national uh, workshop for, uh, to draft our national consensus for PRT, PSMA, MIBG, and CERT. So this is uh, to help us to establish a minimum training requirement program uh, to train our local diagnostic teams and also to standardize the procedures uh, for uh, for the treatments because uh, most of our doctors are actually trained in different uh, institutes so we need to uh, standardize the procedures so that uh, it's more easily for us to, um, to, to, to have a dialogue uh, with our insurance uh, company as well. And, and, and during this uh, meeting, we also discussed the importance of doing an uh, internal dosimetry uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, this uh, group of patients. So um, lastly, um, I would just try to re-emphasize again, the awareness program and the corporate program is very, very important if you want to have uh, uh, patience uh, for your treatments. So um, uh, the first thing is that you, uh, we should uh, be able to penetrate uh, the treatment options like PRT and PSMA into a clinical uh, guidelines and the ESMO guideline, NCCN guideline, and the ENEX uh, guidelines, and even in your own uh, local guideline, because without uh, these, uh, the other uh, doctors may not uh, uh, may not have uh, may not aware that this uh, treatment is basically uh, available. Okay, and and I, I think that uh, most of the other discipline doctor, especially our referring uh, doctors, will not read the ENM guidelines. And second thing that you might have must should have a regular uh, MDT meetings. And uh, like in my center, we have our MDT meeting at least uh, uh, one or uh, one in a uh, one week or two weeks uh, uh, period. So the regular MDT meeting is very important because uh, there are new updates of the treatment options and how do you position uh, your treatment and sequencing your treatments uh, into the new uh, uh, management uh, algorithm. And the third one is try to present in a clinical conference. Uh, uh, so that uh, everyone uh, aware that uh, this treatment is basically available in the country, so they might uh, send a case to you. And lastly, uh, the, with the other colleagues, it's very important to have uh, a talk uh, and also uh, publish in the newspaper and, uh, and uh, interview in the media, so uh, to create a more uh, a public awareness, so that the patient also aware that uh, this treatment is available, so they need to travel to other country to, to, to uh, to receive this treatment and second thing is also to help to um, reduce the anxiety of the radiation uh, phobia among the patient. 
So there are, are some other challenges uh, that is out of our control, like the pricing of the radio isotope and the pricing of the treatment, uh, the licensing, how do you get the, it approved from the authority, and also the uh, shortage of the radio isotope supplies, and also the reject of uh, uh, insurance coverage by the insurance company. So um, for these uh, uh, challenges, uh, you need to have a very strong uh, uh, society so you can uh, have a collaborative uh, dialogue uh, with the respective uh, stakeholders like your ministry of health the insurance company the vendor so you might have uh, so that you can uh, get a very competitive uh, price so to help your patients so as summary there are challenges that may interrupt the setup and expressions of a nuclear maximum fraternity in malaysia but create creations of the collaborative platform practicing a value-based maxim and also standardizing the SOP and providing a continuous training to your staff uh, may assist to overcome uh, these uh, challenges. So uh, thank you for your attentions. I finish my talk now. Professor Tan, thank you very much. Will there be any questions or comments regarding the lecture? Yeah, I'm Dr. Ed Kim, invited professor uh, at Seoul National University. Can you hear me well? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. I certainly congratulate uh, your activity uh, forming uh, Asia Pacific New Endocrine Tumor Society as well as a uh, uh, sort of a national consensus uh, for the uh, PRRG, <coughs> other things. I think that's a very important since we know that cancer is uh, basically related to genetics. And the, uh, uh, we know that uh, certain gene mutation in uh, Asian uh, patient uh, compared with the Americans are different. For example, uh, in uh, lung cancer, uh, IRESA, which is a uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, works very well for Asian patient. Uh, mm -hmm. And also hepatoma, the clinical picture is quite different between Asian countries and uh, United States or Europe. So uh, uh, if you have a, a significant amount of patient uh, data, then you might uh, find uh, some difference of uh, certain tumor biology and also a therapeutic effect. Basically, uh, you know, we are always following uh, European or Americans' uh, discovery of certain therapy. But uh, I always uh, raise a question uh, as to whether we uh, seeing same sort of effect, I doubt because of a fundamental difference of a genetic background, uh, but no one shows any significant data. So through all your society or additional consensus, I hope you generate such a important data. If there is a significant difference of a therapeutic effect, then we have to research why and what other therapy may give a better effect? You know, so uh, if you have any, uh, you know, your thinking, you can certainly uh, mention now, but uh, uh, that's my hope uh, to you. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Professor uh, Kim. Yes, actually, we uh, noticed uh, there is uh, some um, variations uh, between the treatment response uh, if you just follow the guideline, especially the prostate cancer, we, we find that uh, 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 the, the treatment of a PSMA is not that easy that is uh, being uh, published by our uh, 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 colleague uh, in, in, in Europe and also in Australia. Because uh, mainly it's, uh, it's not necessarily, it's just a genetic per se. It might be because of the, the whole uh, population variety. Like uh, in uh, Malaysia, uh, usually the prostate cancer was diagnosed a bit late uh, compared to the more uh, advanced country, uh, because from our data, our net, uh, our cancer con uh, consensus, uh, not our, our statistic data, uh, find, found that uh, it's actually most of our patients when they uh, was diagnosed is at the age of uh, 50 to 60, 
and about 50% of the patients already got the metastasis during the diagnosis, uh, during the diagnosis compared to the uh, more advanced country where they have a more uh, a proper a PSA screening program in their country. So in Malaysia, it's a big difference. So, um, and most of this group of the patient, when they are diagnosed, they are, will go to uh, the initial definite treatments, but then uh, they, will, they don't have the coverage for the uh, anti-androgen therapy. So this is uh, one of the setback as well, because the, this group of treatment, uh, when they end up in, uh, in our uh, government hospital, because of the funding issue, they will only uh, being treated with the, the first line hormonal treatments. So uh, they are unable to get the second line. So when they already uh, progress, then they don't know what to do with the patients. It, it's not like a, a more structured uh, uh, treatments uh, algorithm in the Europe, so we cannot apply in our country. So we find that uh, for PSMA, when they come to us, usually they are at a very late stage. And uh, we found that most of our patients also, um, the, the incidence of a urosepsis is actually quite high because uh, when they come to us, they already got a very extensive uh, lymph nodes mass causing obstruction uropathy, and then they have a stand in. And then uh, even though we treat them with PRT, uh, PSMA, we are giving them some DEXA and all these things may re re reduce their immune uh, immunity and then uh, we'll, we'll, they will uh, develop uh, uh, infections. So um, although the uh, the side effect of uh, the our radionuclide therapy actually is quite low, but they are usually having some other other uh, other uh, complications uh, from from their own uh, disease. So sometimes it's uh, not easy to yeah to 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 do the study based on just uh, the, the treatment uh, yeah in in our country. Thank you very much. That was good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, so, so in line with Professor Kim's comment, questions. Uh, but do, so, in your experience, what is there some predicted markers for the PRRT for neuroendocrine tumor patients? What kind of predicted markers do you think? Uh, actually, the, um, for neuroendocrine is a, a very a big. Uh, it's a heterogeneous uh, tumor and then it actually can occur in uh, most part of the body. Um, if you're talking about just uh, gap nets uh, or the pancreatic nets, so uh, sometimes uh, you you want to do a common graining A and we just, sometimes we do a, a PSF, uh, the, uh, the gallium dotate and then the uh, FBG to help us to, uh, to, to predict uh, the aggressiveness of the tumor, but it's not always uh, true because uh, we have uh, patients with a G3 nets was uh, never end up in uh, uh, initially with us. It will end up by the oncology team and they will start the chemo uh, straight because of the G3 nature, the G3 tumor. Uh, uh. So, uh, but eventually we found that uh, when the patient having disease progressions after the chemotherapy, when they come to us, we do a gallium dotate, we found that the patient, the tumor actually have a very high uh, 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 uptake uh, on the gallium uh, dotate. So like for G3 uh, pancreatic is sometimes is very hard because we don't have a genetic testing like the DDAXX uh, uh, gen genome uh, to test whether uh, uh, the, the, the patient is actually under the G3 neuroendocrine tumor or the G3 neuroendocrine uh, carcinoma. Sometimes it's very hard. So uh, the only available uh, tool for us is to do a dual uh, method uh, imaging, the PET scan, like uh, performing a gallium uh, dotate and then a, a FDG PET to help us to uh, uh, quantify, uh, to, to assess the patient whether they are at the more aggressive group or the non so aggressive group. But there are, there are other neuroendocrine tumor as well, like the thymic carcinoma. I have one patient with a thymic carcinoma uh, having treated with chemotherapy. And when they come to us, they do a gallium dotate, the uptake is not very high, but the uptake is actually uh, involved the whole um, a bone. Actually, it's like the whole, it's like a, a, a bone, a bone uh, the super scan uh, on the bone scan uh, on the gallium dotate of this thymic cancer. So uh, this patient also, they have been run out of the treatment. So we uh, treat them with the low dose of uh, PRT so that to help us to control the disease. But eventually patients survive and they, uh, she is still, uh, survive uh, after uh, I think uh, one or two years after the COVID uh, he was given the treatment before the COVID so so sometimes it's very hard to, to, to judge I think there is no uh, proper biomarker it all depends on 
uh, the whole clinical pictures of the patients, like the patient comorbidity, and then uh, uh, and, and then uh, what are the uh, patients quality of life? All this is quite important to take into account. Yeah. Thank you. And as you shown from the slide, you there was a regarding the acute SMA. If you mentioned it was approved, what is the meaning of approved? Is it by the national authority or like by your uh, hospital IRB or? Oh, okay. All our uh, new uh, radioisotope must get approval from the Ministry of Health. So uh, that's why uh, it, uh, for us, uh, for the new radioisotope, like, let's say you have in Malaysia, if you approve your lutetium for Dotate, then if you want to move to PSMA, you no need to uh, apply because uh, they only approve for radioisotope. But, uh, so if like, actinium is considered a new radioisotope, then we need to get approval from the Ministry of Health. Yeah. Uh, so now you can do like any like actinum to tape or actinum to to PSMA. Like now you have the approval for the actinum. Yeah. Uh, okay. And actually, I think it also you mentioned as a concern and some. But so now, how do you uh uh how do you define uh how do you define the pricing and. How do you recruit patients for the in your nation? Like actually, uh, from other countries, actually that's quite a concern. Before establishing such a uh, PRRT or PSMA therapy, like pricing is quite high, and so like there should be like necessary patient, like uh, at least some patients. Uh, so how do you manage that kind of? Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, this is a very very tough uh, issue. Um, but the, uh, for Malaysia, the insurance scheme in Malaysia is a bit different uh, from some of the country like in Korea, because uh, for Malaysia the insurance uh, scheme is uh, based on product, so uh, it's not based on disease. It's not like other country where like let's say you have neuroendocrine tumor, and you have uh, the 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 PRT is already in the algorithm then they will cover uh, for these treatments uh, or you have to stand for uh, data on the uh, the, the value-based uh, maximum data uh, to the authority the, the insurance company then once they approve then it already uh, but for Malaysia it's a bit different for Malaysia the insurance scheme is based on product that means that uh, it depends on uh, what type of product you buy from the insurance company so it's not based on this so in Malaysia usually uh, their, 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 their product is based on three main category uh, the inpatients, inpatient product, uh, daycare product, and the outpatient product. So uh, it's a bit different. So if you buy all these three products, then you depends on the amount you might get uh, covered for the treatments. With regard whether the, 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 the drug has been approved by FDA or not approved by FDA, because it's already a, a part of the, like, let's say you do PLT, patient need to admit for one day, or they can do under daycare, then they, are being, uh, they will uh, get reimbursed. So uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, different our uh, Malaysian uh, insurance uh, scheme compared to the other country. Thank you. Oh, so sorry for making a lot of questions. Uh, just for last, oh, I worry. think also <clears throat> I think you have quite a lot of experience. So currently, how do you do you usually do the dosimetry and like do you mm. uh, adjust? The cycle or num numbers of cycles were like normally you do four cycles or do you uh, have more cycles for patients who can actually manage it yeah actually uh, frankly speaking uh, i think dosimetry is mainly more applicable uh, i mean uh, you from the surtex we we know that uh, dosimetry is very important because it can help us to guide um uh, the the treatment dose and also uh, to guide us uh, on um, the, to predict the side effect you know, yeah, for Certex. But for uh, actually for PRT and PSMA, um, uh, the internal dosimetry is still uh, not, is at the development uh, stage. Okay, so, uh, uh, but we do for many, for most of the patients, uh, especially the patients are at the uh, uh, older age group and they have a single kidney and uh, they have a renal impairment like diabetes uh, and then with a low uh, GFR, the estimate GFR. Uh, uh, this group of patients, usually we will uh, perform a dosimetry for this group of patients. Uh, however, when you want to translate the data, sometimes it will be a bit hard because when you draw the tumor dose, 
sometimes like uh, the tumor dose is only about 19 gray, which is not enough. If you look at the radiation oncology, uh, uh, the, the way they are doing the, the treatment for RT, the dose actually is not enough to kill the tumor. So uh, the, 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 the data, I think, is still uh, at the de uh, development stage, but we need to gather this data so it can help us to uh, in, in futures so that we can more likely for us to predict the response of the of the uh, of the tumor and also uh, to uh, assess uh, the side effect but so far i think uh, it doesn't really correlate sometimes like uh, when you calculate the kidney dose for a patient for prt sometimes the patient only can receive up to uh, four cycle but when you give to fifth cycle and sixth cycle the, the kidney function is still maintained so it just uh, gives us a rough guide and second thing is that it's also helped us to reassure ourselves and also reassure the patient that uh, the dose is, we are not uh, accessing the dose that may damage the kidney. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful lecture and comment. Uh, would there be any others from the participants? I think, I think there may be more, many participants who are actually preparing the establishment of diagnostics in their own center. Would there be any other questions? Uh, yeah, Dr. Su. Uh, I have one question. Hi. Hello, Dr. Tan. Uh, it's a uh, congratulations for your effort to establish the PRRT and PSMA. I have a uh, question. Uh, do you... Uh, how do you set up the price for patient? I mean, uh, do you set up by your society so the price will be the same across your country or it depends on its own uh, hospital? Oh, okay. Uh, the, the price is uh, depends on the, uh, the, the hospital and the vendor because uh, in Malaysia, actually, we have a lot of uh, vendor that are able to bring uh, radioactive iodine from a various country. So, uh, because I told you, it's not about the brand of the, the radioisotope. It's, uh, it's, the, the, it's just the isotope that is already approved. Then you can use, you can buy from any other country. So, um, so if like some set, some vendor are able to get a cheaper price, then the price will be lower. So, um, so that's why the price is not, uh, it's not like a standard price uh, in, in, in Malaysia. <laughs> it's more, uh, it's more competitive lah. Sometimes, yeah, oh. the, the price is more competitive. But the government hospitals always uh, lower have low, okay, lower uh, price. Uh, for Malaysian, the government hospitals uh, at this moment they don't cover the the cost of the drug because um, it's still uh, uh, is 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 a lot, so it didn't cover uh, by the government uh, hospital. So patient have to pay uh, for the drug. So they the uh, what to do is that the the, the government hospitals uh, they have to uh, discuss with the vendor and then the patient will bill. Uh, the, the, the bill actually go to the patient for the drug. So the patient pay the drug and then only uh, it, uh, the, they bring the drug into the hospital and then they treat the patient in the hospital. Okay. And uh, may, uh, may I know where do you get the lutetium uh, from, from which country? Uh, okay, so the lutetium uh, in Malaysia, uh, mainly there are two main uh, supplier is from ITG. We are getting from ITG. And uh, the other one is from the IDB uh, from Poland, the initial uh, company for Lutatera. <laughs> yeah. So usually we get yeah, from these two uh, hospitals, uh, the country, ITG and IDB. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Thank you, Dr. Su. Thank you. Oh, just one last. Uh, so I think you also have your like own accreditation program for the diagnostic experts, maybe some training program. And I also heard that also Australian society is making such a kind of accreditation program for the diagnostics. So do you have some collaboration with it or do you have a plan? Uh, so would, uh, how should we, <laughs> for the Asian countries, would there be some, how do you, should we prepare for some accreditation programs? Do you have some <laughs> ideas? <laughs> I think for Malaysia, our, our nuclear medicine uh, society is very small compared to like, you no, know, uh, like Korea, uh, China, and Japan. You have a very bigger uh, society. So uh, mainly uh, for us, uh, we 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 just want to start our own uh, 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 guidelines uh, on how do we accreditate the uh, uh, our doctors because uh, some uh, doctors they are trained from like uh, uh, Holland 
and UK, when they come back here, um, the, the procedure sometimes a bit different and they, the drug that they use uh, slightly more, uh, it's slightly different. So we are trying to standardize that. So we actually have, uh, we, are draft, we are currently drafting, drafting the, the minimum uh, requirement uh, uh, whether you can accreditate the doctors uh, after they have uh, they have uh, 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 undergone a certain uh, training in the country even though they have been trained outside when they come back to to malaysia they need to like uh, go to one particular hospital and observe uh, or uh, perform the treatments uh, under guidance uh, for at least a two or three cycle before uh, they can uh, be accredited uh, as a, a theranostic uh, specialist Okay. But this one is not okay. finalized yet. It's still uh, in the pipeline. pipeline. Ah, I see. Okay. So might be in the future there will be also like programs for Asian colleagues too. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And would there be uh further questions or comments? I think if not, uh, I would like to thank again Professor Chan for letting us know your wonderful experience and okay then for other participants we can meet all next week thank you very much okay thank you bye thank you